Welcome to this 10 minute lightning talk, challenges in knowledge graph visualization presented by Jan Zak. You can now start, Jan. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. I'm a senior consultant working uh, for four years in GraphWare. And uh, while well, I'm mostly working as a front-end engineer, uh, working on front-end side of the applications, I care uh, a lot about data visualizations, graphs, and maps, uh, and all these together. And uh, the reason for this talk is that uh, when we start talking about knowledge graphs, uh, first we need to define what, what does it mean for visualization. Uh, in previous talks, we saw, uh, we saw that uh, usually uh, uh, sorry, let me start again. <laughs> so for the purpose of this talk, uh, knowledge graph is, um, uh, I'll, I'll think about it as a, not just a lot of nodes, if you have a huge graph, but also a uh, graph with lots of node types with different levels of importance, because we might store into the graph, uh, not just, uh, let's say, real world entities, like uh, on the right side in the, in the example, uh, I have real world entities like a person or articles, but also we can store in the graph results of uh, some algorithms. In this case, uh, we have uh, results of NLP algorithms uh, parsing the article into sentences and uh, by entity recognition, uh, we can detect uh, multiple per um, people and name occurrences. And in the end, it, uh, it can link to a real world entity, which is Elon Musk. But uh, for the user, uh, these kind of low-level entities, they are not important. And uh, uh, this is one of the challenges uh, in uh, visualiz visualizing a graph with a lot of node types because uh, we can't display it uh, in the graph uh, for the user uh, all, the, uh, all the nodes, but collapse the path somehow uh, into something that's better comprehensible for the user. And the, the other reason for this is that uh, if there are uh, many node types, uh, there can be a lot of different colors or uh, icons, depending on how do you want to show it to the user. But uh, usually in, uh, in data visualization community, there is a, um, and there is a uh, convention that uh, when you are going to use colors, uh, it should be maximum, let's say five or seven or a total maximum is 10 colors because when you use a lot of colors, then uh, they all start to merge in. Uh, they, they are not easy to differentiate. And uh, so we need to filter the list of nodes and node types somehow so that they are not displayed, all of them. And uh, another reason why it's challenging to display a huge graph uh, fully for the user is, of course, technical reason. Uh, because slow performance and rendering performance uh, in the browser um, in web application, it degrades with uh, counts of the nodes. And uh, so, yeah, this is something I wanted to start with, but uh, there is, here is a slide for it. Uh, you saw in, uh, in one of the previous, in many of the previous talks that usual interaction uh, for the user in the UI starts with searching for a node and then expanding uh, for, the, for its neighborhood, but uh, this completely misses the high level picture. So I was thinking about uh, if we can somehow improve it. And I found a very nice uh, paper by Ben Schneiderman. Uh, he's a computer scientist in the US. And the paper is called The Eyes Have It, a task by Data Type Taxonomy for Information Visualizations. He summarizes their different interactions patterns uh, um, and uh, summarizes it into what he's called information seeking mantra. It says overview first, zoom and filter, and then details on demand. So when I tried to apply this pattern to graph visualization, uh, I had to uh, apply a different uh, levels, explicit levels of importance to node types. And uh, what what we've got is uh, here in the in the left uh, side. Uh, this could be the overview showing only the high level nodes, only uh, the real ones. So user could see in the beginning uh, just articles linked with virtual edges linked to Elon Musk. And only if user would uh, explicitly say he's interested into seeing details of a particular path, uh, let's say this mentions path, uh, he could see details of, uh, of the path. 
So it's like a drill down action uh, going through over to detail. And uh, sorry, there is a very nice analogy to this pattern also in in the maps visualization because when you think about it, uh, maps are also graphs, and uh, you can map real ob real physical objects as nodes and neighborhood local neighborhood connections as edges. And when user uh, zooms in and zooms out, uh, he can see different uh, levels by his chosen zoom level. So this is, we were thinking about how to uh, apply um, uh, these ideas from vector maps to graphs. Uh, it goes well. You will see it in the demo that I have prepared uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, yet um, generic graphs are still more complex. There are two challenges. Uh, one of those is that uh, nodes position in visualization is not known before. It must be computed by layout algorithm. Whereas in, in maps, uh, objects have a always fixed static geolocation position. So let's say if we compare graphs and maps, then uh, maps are kind of cheating, right? And the other uh, other reason, for, uh, other difference between maps and graphs is that uh, nodes can be connected to any other nodes in a generic graph. And this can possibly even lead to super nodes, like a node connected to almost everything in the full graph. And uh, in the, compared to maps, this, this can't happen because in maps, uh, the objects can be connected only to other objects that are lo locally uh, nearby to, to the node itself. So this is good analogy, and uh, I'll show you a demo right now. Uh, and the result of this experiment. Uh, please keep in mind this is um, this is R and D uh, kind of experiment, so it's not uh, fully uh, fully production ready. But I hope that it brings some ideas to you, and maybe we will have a, a good good feedback or uh, collaboration after that. I would be happy to see uh, to hear feedback uh, about this visualization pattern. So I'm going to switch to screen sharing now. Uh, where it is? Okay, can you see my screen? I hope you can. And yes, I'm going to Which, show. Yeah. First, I'm going to show a Neo4j browser, of course, as everyone. But uh, I, because I'm working in the front-end graph visualization space, I don't like how er almost everyone uses Neo4j browser for uh, their examples. So this is just a short one to show the full graph that I'm going to demo now. Here we can see nodes of three different types, and the nodes that are starting with L0 are the most important one. Node with, starting with L1 is the less, less important one, and node starting with L3, all these six nodes are the least important ones. And now uh, the challenge is how to, uh, now of course this is an example, and the challenge is, is how to visualize this uh, for, uh, for the user. Uh, if it would be a huge graph. So I have a small application here. Uh, and the interaction pattern uh, that I, I described previously, uh, overview and details on the map, actually shows uh, on, on, the, on the first level, on the first zoom level, just knows with layer zero. And when I drill down by double clicking onto these edges, uh, you can see they have orange color, that means they are virtual edges. And I can drill down to see details of particular connection. I'm zooming in and seeing the details like this. And, yep. and here is the last one. So by this, uh, I was able to allow uh, to display to the user first the overview graph, show him to the high level picture of whatever is stored in the database, while still seamlessly allowed to zoom in into the data. And if you are uh, really used to the search and expand pattern that uh, usual application use, don't worry. This is also supported by this, because when I start with a single node, I can also double click a node. So it expands the neighborhood like this. Uh, and you can see the virtual edges, and you can still double click them and expand to the details of the path. So here we have uh, layer 0, layer 1, and we can expand this to layer 2. And this is completely depending up to the user uh, to how deep level and uh, in which part of the graph he wants to drill down. And uh, so this was the demo. And I will show you uh, a few information how it was built. 
going back to the slides, there are information about it. Uh, can you see my slides again? No. Where it is? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. we can see yeah. them. So, the first ingredient to building this demo was uh, Epoch Virtual Edges, and uh, it's the most important ingredient because I was directly connecting uh, you know, the front end application to, uh, to a very simple backend in Node.js and then to Cypher. But all the heavy uh, graph processing is done by Neo4j and Cypher. So, I was creating virtual edges between uh, nodes where it was necessary to create uh, these uh, virtual connections. And there is also uh, another uh, method in APOC to create virtual nodes, which is useful for, for creating, um, like for example, nodes representing groups, and but uh, that's for a different use case. And the other ingredient I use is uh, a feature in APOC which is quite. Um, Overlooked, and I really liked it when I uh, learned uh, more about it. It's Apoc Path Expanders. It allows you to uh, uh, traverse the graph in in more complicated ways than you could with Cipher. For example, there there is a property for uh, for controlling uh, uniqueness of nodes and uniqueness of paths and uniqueness of edges that are written to. You. And in this simple example, I have um, all. Uh, a uh, query for for uh, getting all paths between a set of nodes, and you can see that uh, it's very easy with uh, with APOC. Uh, while with Safari, you would need to list all the possible nodes, and uh, here I am able to uh, to do it just with with a few lines. But just beware if you are going to try this query, uh, you need to be, be sure that you have the latest APOC uh, release that was released like a few days ago, because before. Uh, it was not working correctly. Uh, com the combination of termination nodes and uh, filter start node uh, equals false, which is the default value. It was still filtering out the terminator nodes, uh, even though they were the starting nodes. Because here uh, in the uh, in the first sample, you can see that starting nodes and ending nodes are the same. So this this uh, this simple query in was not working in the first in the previous release of APOC, but it is working now. And yep, that's the end of my talk. If you have any any feedback about this visualization pattern, I would be really happy to see it um, on Twitter, on email. Uh, you can see my uh, my contacts uh, everywhere online. Because keep in mind, it's just Twitter uh, research, and we we are looking forward to ideas how to improve it. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, let, let, let the folks um, go to the forum to answer the questions. And um, if anybody has any further questions, they can type it in the chat. Yep. Thanks, Live Data, for, for the comment. Yes, APOC path expanders are real powerful. If, if you are trying to do any complex queries with Cypher and you see that there are certain limitations in Cypher, then give APOC path expanders a go. It really goes to the next level of graph theory. But of course, because it, uh, it's, a, it's a custom procedure, you won't see um, correct profiling in, in profile of the query because it, it's just calling a procedure. Okay. okay. Is out. Thank you very much, Jan. We appreciate your talk today. Thank you for joining me here. And Thank you. Have a nice evening. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.